So good morning, everyone. Look, I want to want to say, in the context of of our learning, that my heart is broken with what's happening in Israel, and I hope that you're paying attention. Um, not because I think that there's any clarity here. On the one hand, we've been focusing on the struggle in Israel around the coalition's attempts so far to subvert justice and democracy by disempowering the Supreme Court and to watch hundreds of thousands of Israeli citizens marching against us, to watch Jewish philanthropists from around the world, states, people from everywhere, um, admonish Israel, try to stop Israel, shows the vibrancy of the Jewish society, the Jewish state, that our ancestors longed for. But the last couple of days have seen outbreaks of violence um, that just shatter, shatter. I, I want to do this in the context of learning um, some Torah. So let me frame it with the Torah, and then let me um, speak as freely as, as, as I can. This week's Parsha is Titzaveh, and in it we see countless details similar to last week's Parsha, Truma. Truma is very much about the furniture and the furnishings and even the construction itself of the Mishkan, of the desert tabernacle. Tetzaveh is actually about the priests who serve there and what they wear, how they are to prepare themselves. Their clothing is ornate, especially the high priest, the Kohen Gadol, who in this moment of Torah history is Aaron, the high priest. And among the pieces of clothing that really strikes me, every time I read the list, is the mitznefet, is the, um, it's a headband of sorts, and he wears it everywhere he goes, and it says, Kadosh Ladonai, holy to God. Kadosh means um, holy, but it also means designated. So Aaron's life is dedicated to service, right? The service of God, service of the holy, to bring rituals in the name of the people. It's a very beautiful and complicated way to live your life. On the one hand, I'm a religious leader, rabbis and imams and priests and ministers and pastors and leaders of all kinds, um, including the cases of Ethiopian Jewish ancestry and many others. We dedicate our lives to leading our people, to teaching our people. But it is also true that we um, we can sit down once in a while and not not always feel that burden. The Kohen Gadol, the high priest, wore their task. You know, whenever I stand in an ecumenical uh, prayer service, some of us are wearing collars, and some. So I usually wear a talit to signify Jewish ritual garb. But traditionally speaking, a talit is part of prayer time. Um, a talit katan, a tzitzit that I wear under my shirt is uh, something that is humble and private. But this garb, this headband that the high priest wears, says, holy to God, designated to God, I belong to the Holy One. And I've often thought what about what it must have felt like to wear such a thing. And I, since I don't wear my ritual garb, I wear a kippah, but that doesn't mean I'm a rabbi, it means I'm a Jew. Um, a collar designates you as religious leader wherever you go. And I have a dear friend who is an Episcopalian uh, priest who does not wear the collar everywhere he goes, but often does. Now, I know my dear friend, uh, Father uh, Kevin Weidinger, is, um, is a humble human being. And I believe that the priests were called to be humble too. When Aaron, Aaron, Cohen Gadol, the high priest, would walk around Wearing this headband, how did he feel? Did he ever wear his headband with a sense of haughtiness and arrogance? Because the problem with such a posture, and I actually think Aaron did not wear it with haughtiness and arrogance. I believe he was humble, just like his brother Moshe and his sister Miriam. But if he walked around arrogant, it would be as my teacher, Rabbi Erwin Kula, has taught, when I believe I have more God than you, I'll go get a gun. And what we have seen in these last number of days, and of course decades, and of course centuries, and of course millennia, is the willingness to hurt someone else 
because you believe you have more God than them. It's not that religion is the source of all wars. I think that leaves humanity off, off the hook, and we are, we are a complicated thing. People are complicated. And we inherit trauma from generations gone by, and we cause pain, and pain has been caused to us. But the cycle of violence will never end if we walk around and all we feel is the trauma and we don't pay attention to the power that we wield. It's true that restorative justice means taking real account of the hurt that I have caused and the hurt that's been caused to me and to try to rebalance the scale not by erasing the past but by acknowledging it and taking responsibility for it. And these last days in Israel and in the Palestinian territories have demonstrated an unwillingness to imagine someone else's pain. Where it began, there's no way to say where it began. Just as when you go on the Kotel Tunnel Tours in the old city of Jerusalem, and they are very much designed to show who was there first. You go down archaeological levels to the ancient world, and you can see levels of this community having built here, but that one came first, but that one actually came first. To prove that I was here first means that you don't belong, or that my claim to be on this earth is stronger than yours. And there are three dead young Jewish boys, and there are dead Arab people too. And among the ways that my heart is broken is on my other screen right now. I'm looking at the face of Ilan Ganeles. I hope he pr I pronounce his name correctly, of blessed memory. He graduated Columbia University last year, made Aliyah. He was on his way to a wedding. He grew up in Connecticut, just a couple miles away from here. He was murdered, murdered by terrorists. And there is never, ever a way of explaining or contextualizing terror. The willingness to take someone else's life, to cause terror, to hate them for who they are. There's no context for that. There's no explaining it. This poor boy and his family. And I shared a f just two days ago the faces of Hillel Menachem Yaniv, and Yigal Yaakov Yaniv, brothers, who were also murdered. And I also shared this horrifying picture of Jewish terrorists. Yes, traumatized, but they are terrorists. If I hold Palestinian terrorists to account, I must hold Jewish terrorists to account. And they burn dozens of Palestinian homes. And they stood in the light of the fires they set and prayed, and they davened. You now Aaron was called to wear that headband, and, which said, Kadosh Ladonai, holy to God. Did he walk around thinking that that entitled him to more dignity in life than others? God forbid. There's a legend, and I don't know where it comes from, that, you know, yes, the Kohen Gadol was bedecked in beautiful gems and gold and precious materials. Even his shoes were shiny, but inside his shoes were stones that he walked on every day. We are called, no matter how much power we wield, to see the humanity of the other. And that means my broken heart has to be broken not only because three of my children, three of our children were cut down, but because we, I cannot point to someone who is part of my people and say they, we murdered too. We set fire to homes. We prayed as their homes burned. We attacked the fire brigade that came to, to, to put out the fires. 
Do I blame the state of Israel more than I blame the Palestinian terrorists? No, of course not. Intent matters, and the responsibility to steward a society towards justice matters. But this cycle will not end if only one of us ends up okay. I can't be okay when my brothers daven as they burn other people down. I cannot be okay. God cannot be okay. Our tradition is not okay. Our homeland is not okay. Until we stand right with God, humble enough to see God's image in the face of every other human being, not just those who treat you with kindness or believe in the validity of your homeland. As Ayala just wrote, pain is no excuse for terror. I grieve. Yes, of course, I see these three young men who look just like my children. And that's where my heart goes first. To say otherwise would be lying. And I believe, I believe in the aspirational nobility of the state of Israel. I do. For all that we are going through and all we have gone through, I believe in our home. That's an unconditional love. But I believe that for things to be okay, and I don't know about peace, that might be too far away for me to even think about, but I'd like things to be okay. I'd like not to see more faces like these looking at me from my screen and imagining their families. I'd like less of that in the world. I'm sure you do too. But for that to be the case, it can't only be okay in the Jewish cities and the Jewish towns in the state of Israel and in the Palestinian territories. There has to be some kind of restorative justice. Two claims, even Vladimir Jabotinsky, Zev Jabotinsky, the founder of Jewish maximal Zionism, what we call revisionist Zionism, believed that in fact the claim of home was equally true for the Arabs and for the Jews before the State of Israel was founded. I grieve, but I'm called to also see through my tears and recognize that, that I'm not the only one grieving. How can I be holy to God if I'm not good to all of God's images? I don't have an answer, friends, and I wish I could tie this up in a bow and tell you that Today is a day for inspiration and for things to be beautiful. In my own home, I'm looking out at the beautiful snow, praying that everyone stays warm and safe. But on the way to the window, I see these faces on my other screen. And my heart hurts. And I think it's important that we let that in too. We are responsible. We are responsible and for a world on fire. Mm -hmm. We have to acknowledge that we have set some of those fires too. And to not let our pain lead us into irresponsible actions, to blasphemous actions. I can't change everyone, but I can work on me. Rabbi Israel Salanter, who founded the Musser movement, an ascetic, intellectual, um, Jewish movement in Eastern Europe made the, the very famous um, the very famous statement well, you've probably heard it attributed to other people he said I set out to change the world the world wouldn't change and I set out to change my country but my country wouldn't change so I decided to try to change my family my family wouldn't change and I realized it was only one change I could work on, me. So friends, let's start really, really close to home. 
and let's see if we can create ripples of goodness and accountability way beyond. This is part of our work in the world. May we be blessed to be strong enough to do it. See you tomorrow.